Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am very privileged to have Carl Weaver here, as you know, who's going to give us some insights about what's happening with mobile technology, 5G, uh, boat, the uh, Internet of Things, and, and a lot more to uh, help us make decisions that uh, hopefully, hopefully will uh, improve the quality of our life. Uh, welcome, Carl, to the show. John, thank you very, very much for welcoming me today. It's a great day. Now, it's great to have you here. Now, I know you have another name. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but I know a lot of your Chinese counterparts uh, call you by that name. What is that name, Carl? My Chinese name is Wei Car, and that name was given to me in 1982 when I first started learning Mandarin Chinese at National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei, Taiwan. Wow, uh, that's not a name I'm probably going to call you by. I'll just use Carl, okay? <laughs> well, if you notice the Chinese name Wei is equivalent to my last name Weaver, and Car is equivalent to Carl. So it's a literal translation. Um, the car has no meaning at all, but the so way we, we way, car, we way, car. car, car, you have to curl the tongue. We car. It's not that hard, actually. I, I could get no, it. No, it's not. I, I, but I won't be teaching you today. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask you, Carl, you know, um, your background is, is really interesting, as I've seen many of the accomplishments uh, you've made and a lot of the presentations uh, that you've uh, been part of and panels. I got to ask you, how did you get into this field? In 1982, in 1980, I started to formulate the concept of a Pacific century when I was living in, um, you know, I'm originally from Massachusetts, the Boston suburbs. So in 1980, I went into Harvard University, the John K. Fair, Fairbanks East West Center, and I formulated the concept of a of a China market uh, technology specialist. And then in, I, when I graduated from university in Newport, Rhode Island in 1982, I was able to receive a scholarship to first study Mandarin Chinese in Taiwan for three years. I studied Mandarin in Taiwan for three years, and in 1985, I jumped into the fledgling microcomputer manufacturing industry in Taipei, Taiwan. I worked there seven years, uh, and then I returned to the United States in 1992, late 92, and in 93, I reinvented myself as a wireless market, land mobile radio communications industry because the digital cellular world wasn't quite there in the early, early 90s. And then I worked my way up to digital cellular technologies, um, and eventually, um, the mobile uh, mobile smartphones, I became a mobile smartphone specialist uh, at the turn of, just after the turn of the century. I think you're on mute. John, oh, that's an interesting, interesting path you have there. Yeah, you were just on mute, yes. I was it, on mute. Okay. It, it, they, they had a joke a while back, one of my friends was saying, you know, if you're in one of these calls, I'm not going to do it today. If you're the last person, you're told you're on mute, you have to drink. But I'm not drinking today, guys, so I'm, unfortunately. Yeah, well, um, the, the interesting thing, John, is I put this plan into play um, just upon graduation because, you know, when I was when I graduated, all my friends were enjoying the summertime, going to the Cape, Cape Cod, and you know, uh, Massachusetts in the summertime has fantastic beaches. But I was dedicated. I got on a plane after two months of working at a McDonald's as a manager trainee. I knew I was going to Taiwan, um, and I saved a little money by becoming a McDonald's manager trainee. But I knew I was getting on a plane in 1982. I got on a plane. It was almost 24 hours from Boston. Logan Airport into Taipei, Taiwan, and I was embarking in the middle of the summer, extremely hot and humid, on my professional into into technology. And um, you know, at that time, it was only computers; it wasn't the wireless industry. It was in Taiwan; it was only microcomputer manufacturing. So I I was very very lucky and fortunate. That is amazing. This this journey now. I, I've been following you for a little while, and uh, I learned that you had become a dedicated mobile industry executive in the Chinese world for, I think it's 37 plus years, if I'm correct. That's How correct. did you get on that path? That's really interesting. In 1990, late 92, um, I returned to the United States, and I I decided to be closer to the Asian uh, influence because I could speak, read, and write Mandarin Chinese after 10 years in Taiwan. I decided to settle in Seattle because it was the easiest, easiest jump-off spot 
to jump shoot Asia, China, Taiwan, India, Korea, Japan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I have been doing for all of those years, using Seattle as the base to quickly jump shoot and very easily jump shoot Asia. So in 1993, I jumped into the land mobile radio communications industry before the digital cellular world. The digital cellular world here in the Washington state area didn't kind of evolve until 1998 or 99 when Sprint had the first 2G network. Um, believe it or not, Sprint had the first um, 2G network based on CDMA. Uh, AT&T had bought, um, uh, they had bought Macaw Cellular and they eventually became, um, um, AT, uh, they became AT&T Wireless somehow. Oh, they had a, b a bunch of name changes. So by the turn of the century, I was, I was now back into the digital uh, cellular industry. I already had about a decade uh, of experience under my belt, and I was w uh, working for uh, Western companies, taking mobile technologies and getting them designed in and sold to the uh, Asia Pacific Rim. Um, and in, in 2003, um, I was basically thrown into the job market um, due to due to company going bankrupt after 9/11. You know, it was a tough time. Anyway. Um, I reinvented myself as the first public speaker in smartphones in the world because I was working on the first smartphone project in North America with a small, uh, my, a small embedded antenna company that had the project with Microsoft. So I gave the first smartphone presentation on Microsoft's campus in 2003. I um, remember, I remember Rim. I remember Rim and what they did and, and the, with the sidekicks and things like that. Then they it was Rim. Got... It was Rim. It was, um, it was Rim. It was Nokia. It was um, Handspring, if you can remember. And we had we had BlackBerry doing some things too. Yes, BlackBerry yeah. was doing a few things. The Sidekick um, and stuff like that. Sidekick was another product. Those were all early. And then the real first smartphone in North America was HTC's, um, based on Windows Mobile. That was the real first smartphone in North America uh, de de developed for Windows Mobile because Nokia never penetrated North America with their Symbian operating system. So, Carl, I have to ask you, so with all this emergence of technology and, you know, the, the uh, I guess, the changing and the acceptance uh, of the Internet of Things, uh, people are, I guess, just taking it for granted. I know a lot of times myself, I use my iPhone uh, 12 Max Pro. Wow. And uh, since, since I've had the, since I've had the 10X, I have always just, whether it was the finger before the 10, just to make my payments, or now it's the touch the button and then look at the phone. And knowing that my payment is being sent securely and safely, which I believe, but a lot of people use something called cryptocurrency. I know people that have these rigs in their basement, in their homes. Some people don't even have jobs and they have this form of servers. And I ask them what they're making. And uh, just then they say, oh, we're making probably around 20 to $40. I said an hour. They said maybe a day. And I said, that's not a lot. Well, that's why we need a lot of machines. I said, but doesn't it cost you money to run this this power? So talk to us about cryptocurrency. Is that really safe? And um, is it really good for anything? Or should we avoid that like the plague, Carl? No, you should not avoid cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency is basically a decentralized form of payment um, be between point A and point B. And lots of... Um, Lots of people, lots of organizations want to use it as a private means of transferring funds. And it's it's not controlled by any government. It's not controlled by anybody. Uh, if the go if you know, it's basically not controlled because it's decentralized. And really, it's very difficult to stop it. And, and regulations and restrictions, etc., like they have in China. Um, it serves a purpose. It absolutely does serve a purpose. But the problem is with cryptocurrency. Uh, which, by the way, uses blockchain. The whole key is cryptocurrency is nothing but one use case of the blockchain. But the whole problem is storing the cryptocurrency private keys. The problem is when you try to store the cryptocurrency private key on a on an exchange and or on a smartphone, it's very, very difficult to secure the private keys because even though the keys are encrypted, they're stored in the open operating system of the smartphone. So it's very easy for hackers to steal it, especially on Android smartphones. However, Samsung has... Put, to, put in place a pretty good security and, and secure enclaves and chips to secure their private keys. And so, you know, if you have an end, uh, if you have a Samsung smartphone, uh, and also Apple has done a good job. The key is 
with these crypto wallets, the wallet, there are hundreds of crypto wallets on the world today and lots of manufacturers. And um, on the Apple store, they have an SDK that you must use in order to encrypt and make sure that the private keys are secured inside a secure enclave in their Apple chips. They're a, I think they started at A10 or A11 to secure the private key credentials uh, inside of a chip. And Samsung does the same thing. So you need to add the, ask the hard questions of your smartphone manufacturer. How are you storing cryptocurrency from the wallet? That's a very, very important point. This even gets to the point of security when we think about apps or websites. And I love when they have these programs and their password is stored in an open text file. I mean, are they, are they serious? Do you remember PGP where we talked about pretty good privacy protection and then we got better with other types of keys and companies that could actually, you know, make it so that your signature had to be validated? Uh, I mean, now you know what's happened with email. Uh, if you are not approved uh, with a DMARC record um, and have certain things set up uh, in your uh, area for your server for sending mail, you're going to be flagged. Uh, your email is not going to get delivered. This wasn't like this uh, five years ago, ten years ago. Because the spam world is just growing so much. Well, this is job security for hackers. You have to understand from their standpoint. So the problem is, is that most of the companies, uh, it was lip service when it came to mobile security, uh, network security. It was lip service twenty years ago. It was lip service. Now they have to start to care because they've been too many too many breaches and uh, lots of people have lost their jobs the key point is is how much security is secure and how do you really stop security without governance that's the big problem right. there's no governance there is there are security apparatuses in place that all vendors should use mobile network operators should be uh, pitching the holy grail of security um, and they're not because the government is not pushing them enough for that. It should be the operators pushing it down to the handset vendors. And, I agree. And ultimately, all of the hackers in the world need to be certified uh, as ethical hackers. Um, and when they, they basically need to be certified. When you're in control of designing technology, hardware and software, and, it, and it's all being outsourced all over the world, that th there's no way to guarantee the ethics and the integrity of the developer developing either the hardware or the software. There really is none. And so the and so governance, the only way is governance. You can't monitor people, uh, well, they do in China, but even not enough. So the only way is governance, and I've been talking about that, and it really is, uh, it's it's getting that way. It's getting better. The Europeans are, are on that with their GD, um, GDPR. G GDPR, yeah, they're, yeah, they're getting very tight in America and U.S. is going on it too. But now if, if let's say you get an IP address and with IPv4 being so limited, we really don't have many left, it's very hard to get them. Uh, if somebody happens to hand you a block of IP addresses that let's say were mutilated and abused, now you have to go through hell to get those IP addresses removed from a list, like getting them delisted. And yep. Microsoft, forget it. It's like almost impossible. They have a delisting process, and then they tell you you can't delist it, and then you have to wait for them. And they don't even have a phone number you can call. Right. It, this, this reminds me when I was interviewed by um, a Canadian television about BlackBerry um, going into China and how uh, there are companies counterfeiting BlackBerrys. They call them Redberries. I was interviewed, and um, the, the Canadian broadcaster gave DVD of the interview, I uploaded that to Google. About a, about a, six months to a year later, Google said, um, you must take this down. This is infringing upon intellectual property. I said, well, wait a minute. The Canadian television gave it to me. They gave me the DVD and they told me to use it. I didn't sign any document. That was my mistake. But now Google was putting the heavy hand on me. We w must remove it. And if if we don't remove it, we will remove your account and you will never have Google, blah, 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 blah. I know they make, they make it so crazy. And now even with certain security uh, companies and cameras, I mean, we've gotten so crazy now that for many years ago, there was something called an NDA. The NDA didn't mean non-disclosure. It basically was a document that allowed or basically disallowed uh, governments to allow that product in their country, like some of the cameras. And that's why a lot of companies in the U.S. ripped out these cameras because they had things like secret 
uh, microphones on board. Even if they didn't have a microphone, they were still listening and they were still able to back it into your camera. Right. So none of this will stop, by the way. And um, governments around the world, rogue organizations around the world, um, they want the best hackers because everybody is hacking everybody else around the world. It's a fact. Everybody is hacking everybody else. Some of them for purely ethic, um, some of them for purely cosmetic reasons like commerce. Um, um, the key point here is if you're training an engineer, software or hardware engineer, you need to train them that whatever they try to hack into needs to be for ethical purposes. If it's exactly. not, if it's not for ethical purposes, then there needs to be governance, and they, they, that that company, that person, should be black blacklisted from um, cr you know pursuing their craft uh, down the road. That's the only way to stop it. You're never going to stop because there's going to be a there's going to be a breach, a patch, a breach, a patch, and that's what I've been seeing. However, companies like Microsoft are starting to invest more in hardware. Apple is very sophisticated. They have their own uh, A series chips mm -hmm. in order to provide better security. Like the A10, the A11, A12, the new chips. Yes. Google and started this, I think, several years. They were the first ones, right? Google started something called No Trust. Were they the first ones? No. They put a chip on their boards. This was about, I'm going to say, five or ten years ago, but they made it public, and they didn't trust their own technology. Well, I don't think Google was the first, but they were the first. It's good to see. It's good to see Google doing that. Now, remember, a lot of this drives back to uh, geopolitics with the whole semiconductor industry. All right, because there are really only three fabs uh, or f fab manufacturers in the world today of prominence: Intel, Samsung, and TSMC in Taiwan. Obviously, China wants all of this technology, um, but but not based on lithography manufacturing's laser process. The Chinese are reinventing with a new kind of process. Um, it's impossible to stop a country that really wants to uh, develop a technology. So, uh, the Chinese are going to probably try to leapfrog existing lithography, laser etching yep. technology. That's that's they're just, already doing it with three D. Look at some of the world's best three D printing. It's coming from China. Yes. So, um, it's Protectionism never works and never benefits anybody. Uh, you think it benefits you, but it doesn't. The Japanese learned that the very hard way. So back back to the key point here, which is that security is important and every country needs to work together. If I were to tell you that actually smartphones in China have re really good security uh, and the Chinese government cares about your about self-sovereign identity, you might say, Carl, you, you have a hole in your head. But actually they do. And they are concerned... Uh, like the Europeans, like the Americans, about data privacy. They are. They've gotten very crazy with their cameras and the way they have them in every corner. I mean, they've gotten camera crazy Wait. over there. Yes, yes, they have. They have surveillance. Um, and they got surveillance for surveillance for surveillance. I mean, they're just like nuts. I mean, I think there's a privacy level to things, and if you're doing something that's in a public space, I get it. But you know, there's points that are privacy that they should not be in. However, having said that, see, I play. I will play devil's advocate, and I will use a, a very level EQ because the only way to survive in the Chinese world, because I have history with China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, real history, um, uh, you know, global changing history, is to keep a level EQ. Google, Facebook, even Amazon and Twitter, they're also manipulating your data and selling it. I know. In the on the dark web, so they are. You're correct. You shouldn't. You shouldn't sit in glass houses and throw stones. Um, so I, 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 I agree with you. And I, like, for example, a while back, I had gotten locked out many years. And or I was helping a client. They said, well, you have to get a passport. I'm like, we're not giving you a passport so you could go sell it out the back door? I mean, it's like they have no right to request this information. Who are they? Now at least there's a new governing board, as you know, that's there for Facebook and Instagram, that if they say you can't, you can't go through, I think that's great. I think we're going to see more of that, Carl. I think more no of doubt. No doubt. It was driven by the Europeans and actually the Chinese and the South Koreans and the Japanese um, are, are, are playing a key role <clears throat> in the continued development of that. Because really? those regions, oh, absolutely. Because, you know, cryptocurrencies um, were very big in China. And as you know, the largest mining of, of Bitcoin in the world is coming from China. It's coming from China. So, but, but our own thing is, is that when you think of China, I always think of them always trying to hurt us. You know, like they're always, obviously everybody's trying to be you know, in their own space and be competitive. I get it. But 
how do you know you can at least coexist together? Because that's always a fear when I hear China, like, you know, look at what happened now and not to bring up the pandemic. But there are lots of things that I'm sure, you know, don't leave a good taste in your mouth. And yeah. How do we get over those things? Right. So I have been in the Chinese world for a very, very long time. And I know that it's a matter of uh, are there some Chinese behaviors people in the West do not like? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> there are also things that people in the West do that the Chinese don't like. So my viewpoint is a coexistence. COVID-19 is a bad thing. Um, I, I prefer not, not to discuss uh, sure. where it came from because I think, sure. that, that I think we pretty much know where it came from. Absolutely. But the key point is, is to demonize the Chinese for being entrepreneurial, which they are, and also innovative and creative, which they also are, is the wrong approach. My approach is... So here's my strategy. Day one, I would require all U.S. soldiers stationed in South Korea, Japan, uh, and various parts of the world to require language training, language and cultural training in the country where they are. This would be my requirement for every U.S. soldier operating around the world. It's not enough just to be defending those countries. You have to understand those customs and cultures. So. Take away the gun for a, few, for a little while, put the language book, and then you're creating you, hundreds of thousands more ambassadors for your country rather than uh, basically p creating a bad influence, number one. Number two, all American universities should be teaching Mandarin, but that Mandarin scholarship should be coming from Google, Facebook, Microsoft. No. They, they no. make too much money. They make too much money only on data. They should be investing in semiconductor chip manufacturing to make sure that we maintain our cutting edge. They are not doing that. So uh, if, I, if I had the opportunity to reallocate, if I had the opportunity to be the strategist for how America competes with the Chinese on technology per se, uh, because remember, there are things that Chinese do give to us and there are things that we give to the Chinese. I don't demonize anybody uh, because what do you mean by the Chinese? What about the Taiwanese? What about the Hong Kong Singaporeans? Uh, Chinese people, I mean, I, I don't get into geopolitics with governments, but Chinese people are hardworking, industrious people. Threat, they, China can be a threat if you allow it to be a threat. Right. If, you, if you have strategies, right. I'll give you a perfect example. In 2008, I was hired by Jumalto to push near-field communications technology into China. But I discovered that there was lots of techno-nationalism and protectionism inside China. There was no Google, Facebook, or YouTube. China banned them all. So what did I do? I started to give them all my public speaking presentations in Mandarin, number one. Number two, I uploaded those videos to Chinese video streaming websites to legally overcome the Great Firewall to get my videos, technology videos on near-field communications and payment. Uh, to the movers and shakers in China. All of that is legal. There's nothing wrong with it. I've had lots of Chinese officials um, probably look at my website and say, wow, wow, that's pretty good. So you see, some of the fear is the fear of the unknown with Western people regarding the Chinese world. So I want to debunk that. I need to debunk that because uh, I, deal with, I deal with greater China every single day. I, I, I get it. And, and I agree with you on one point. You know, I, as, as I was reading a lot of the stuff you've worked on, I was very interested to know about, uh, I think it's called something called Hawker. You probably know this better than I do. They call it a Hawker, H-A-W, I think, K-E-R. And I was really interested to learn what, I guess, is, is it not the Chinese, it's actually the, um, I forget which part of the world it is, but it's very close in there. And they uh, are, they work very hard to build a business. Uh, in like these, uh, I guess you call it like shops and stuff like that. I'm not sure if you if you came across any hawkers in your time. Um, are we talking about an ethnicity of Chinese race? Uh, the hawkers is it's it, it's like they actually uh, if I'm, maybe I'm saying if I'm saying this correctly they are a uh, it's a job being a hawker. It's I, I was told it's a job. They hawker they they basically go and they they make their craft. There's one lady who's 93 or 94 years old and she makes noodles. And it's, it's, it's like a profession. They call it a hawker. But which amazed me is how hardworking they are and, and what they do and how they literally, uh, you know, they put their whole lives in that it's a family obligation to be a hawker. Uh, and I so, had never known that. So the interesting thing is in America, we have lots of small businesses and some of them are family run 
Um, but in, in China, all the small businesses are family run and you would never hire somebody that you could not trust in a small business in the Chinese world. So it is these small businesses that you're talking about. And a small, small business could be sim as simple as having a stall that you have out on the street and you're cooking noodles and then people come by and sit down and eat the noodles and it's very, very cheap. This is they amazing. Call, they call them pop-up shops, and then they had right. formal shops. That's what I thought was interesting. I, I, I survived as a young, starving student of Mandarin in Taiwan in the 80s with, by this. This is how I survived. Wow. Uh, penny, pe uh, you know, I was, I was a starving student in the 80s when I was studying Mandarin. I did anything I could do uh, to, you know, because I was on my own. There was no email. There was no, um, uh, th there were faxes. Uh, after I finished my Chinese studies, uh, but very few before that. So, and, 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 you know, we're talking about pay phones and coins, calling back to Boston. Hey, Ma, I've run out of cash. Help. <laughs> you know, um, with, with, all this, with, with all this transpiring, you know, the one thing that always seems to come to my head is uh, United Nations. And the fact that I believe, I'm not sure what year it was, and you might know better than I do, uh, where you couldn't bring certain phones through the United Nations, because our 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 uh, embassy had forbid them. You had to leave them at the gate. Right. right. The interesting thing about the whole smartphone industry right now, and people will debate with me, but I tell them because I was the first public speaker in smartphones. It's all migrating, but look to where the cash is going. So there are people who say, well, Ch China will always be, be making smartphones. I totally disagree. The Vietnamese, okay. the Vietnamese are, are now making smartphones. The Indonesians are making smartphones. Well, well, look who's making, look who's making, look who's making uh, home um, uh, modems, home modem gateways for Optum and Altice. It's the Vietnamese. Yes, and Vietnam because Samsung transferred all of the manufacturing to Vietnam. But it's this race to the bottom that people think. Well, it has to be. It's actually the African continent because the people in the African con continent are hungry uh, and they should position themselves to accept all of this technology coming from the Chinese, the Koreans, the Japanese, uh, and, the, and the, the Americans. But they should leverage and not be exploited. But ultimately, if you look at the globalization, I gave a presentation in 2015 about this, the globalization of mobile technologies. I predicted Apple would move. Uh, and some of these co and these companies would move their manufacturing out of China because of techno nationalism and protectionism, uh, and that's ha actually happening. And where are they uh, moving to, Carl? Where are they moving to? Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. But I think eventually, if you look at globalization, it'll be going to the African continent, um, and it makes perfect sense because Asia is not cheap. Le Forty years ago, the value of Asia was the land, the people. I mean, the labor, uh, and everything was cheap. But now it's very expensive because all those resources are, be, are running out, but the people are still there. You, you get the point. Yeah, no I, 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 no I, I get the point. water, air, or land. And that is um, – there is such a thing as the Pacific Century. I, I talk about that all the time. There is the Pacific Century, but um, that just means Asia becomes the most expensive place to live and work, and that is happening. But Carl, I do have a concern. So, you know, without any politics aside, basically, sure. uh, taking this from me being an engineer and looking at these products, I mean, this is a concern of mine. So I have always been uh, very fond of the Aris modems, which were out for years. Uh, I'm not a big Cisco lover uh, because Cisco, as you know, is a company that buys other companies and they're about brands, but they really don't care about the small business. They just care about the money. They right. really changed. Uh, other companies out there, like, uh, you know, let's just say now you've got the, the UV modem and other things. My biggest challenge with these companies is they're making them cheaper, but not so much they're making them cheaper, they're not safer. This is a problem. The new modem that That's true. now true. has a feature that, and I was floored that it had this, which is bad, uh, that the modem would shut 80% of its capacity down if it got too hot. It had thermal throttling software because the thing could potentially catch on fire. And if you put the thing over its side, the thermal software may not react properly and there could be a fire. I mean, that's a problem, Carl. <laughs> okay, so let me take this one step sure. further. Um, sure. I compliment you on your technical knowledge, John. Um, in the world today, let's. I, I don't want to – I'm going to – 
augment this question by talking about 5G and IoT, if, if you don't mind. Sure, you, no problem. You bear in mind. So 5G, faster speeds, lower latency, right? That's the whole goal of 5G. How does that benefit anybody other than um, streaming your video? The real goal of 5G is IoT, the Internet of Things, because everything will have machine learning language to augment AI to crunch data. And you want it to be crunched. And I'll get back to the security side of this. You want to crunch data, right? Fast. So, so mo most things that you have, for, I mean, there's, I, there's AI in your uh, connected car. Teslas have lots of AI using machine learning language. So we think that 5G, and by the way, 6G is now being talked about, but there's, but let's not talk about 6G because that's hype right now because okay. it, it might not even be terrestrial. It might be satellites beaming, uh, st uh, steering beams down from uh, the, orb uh, the orbit. Look at, we have, have you ever heard of um, Boingo? Have you ever heard of Bing Boingo? Boingo. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right. They're streaming. Uh, they're, they're, they're using a beam steering technology from the ground to the air for um, surfing the Internet in various airplanes. I'm not sure how successful that business model is, but if you can stream it from the ground into, onto an airplane, now we're talking about a satellite down. So that's 6G, but let's get back to 5G. There's so much hype in 5G, but 5G will eventually evolve. But it really, really is about IoT uh, and IoT modules on machines and robots. That's what it's about. And it's about us being able to take advantage of that by our phone being able to access all of these um, machines and robots in the future. That's what 5G is about. It's us accessing other things. So my company, which is called ITOS, has come out with um, something called the Boat. It's a software middleware that's embedded into the cellular IoT module. It's called the boat, the blockchain of AI things. Because if you look, the problem with in the internet, the internet of um, of things is security. It's the biggest problem, and a lot of people don't even tackle it. Uh, that's why there's a there's still a problem. But we're tackling it. We're tackling it. We recognize the problem. Um, but AI things or things that have artificial intelligence in them mm -hmm. also need security as much as anything else. We're allowing that to happen because we've partnered with nine uh, Chinese cellular IoT module vendors. The top two okay. are Quick, Quicktel and Fibercom. Those are the those are the two top ones in China. And then okay. we're we're also trying to partner with Western um, cellular IoT module vendors. The goal here is your connected car, eventually your connected toaster will have a module, and that module will be able to remotely over the air if from the field or in the field, program and reprogram and reprogram your device. So your device no, no longer becomes a standalone thing. It will have the right. ability to continuously reprogram itself and do various other things. So this is a, a very, very cool theme of what 5G is about. 5G is about taking things and being able to reprogram them in a safe manner and over long distances. That's what IoT uh, does, but that's also what 5G en enables IoT to do so 5g standalone is not just about downloading a video no that's that's a very simplistic uh, mindset and view of IOT it's us awesome. it's a, it's about smart cities and about smart building well, virtual reality augmented reality that's only the beginning that. 5g will enable that but only if they're using IOT and we think for the trust the blockchain we think for the trust the blockchain and IoT need to be married in the in the in the co in a courtship. Um, they need to be married, and that's so that'll what we have the governance you're talking about. That'll have yes. that compliance or that regulation. Yes, we 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 think that our technology will become the de facto standard because it's on nine module vendors right now, and the module industry, the IoT industry for the modules is very fragmented, um, and the Chinese lead in this industry. Um, there are three major Western companies, Sierra Wireless, mm -hmm. Ublox, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Telit. Those are major companies in the West. We want to partner with those guys. Carl, will, um, this, will this change, as you're familiar with, with the, um, basically, we call it, uh, you know, we have we have the, the standards like the 802.11, 802.11ac, now 802.11ax. Is this going to add another classification 
uh, to that standard series. It's going to change completely because, in my humble opinion, uh, people aren't talking about what Apple and Samsung are have been researching. It's called UWB. And I believe UWB has the potential. But remember, you have to think about YWANs, wireless wide area networks, and YPANs, wireless uh, personal area networks. Right. I, I'm, the, I'm the person who brought NFC technology to China uh, and had it standardized on all these smartphones in two, from 2008 until 2013. Uh, and, and I also um, recognize the importance of NFC technology. It, it, but why, it is why, why did Google, they had a, it was a great thing you did, but why did Google... Uh, a while back, they got rid of that from their browsers. They, they got rid of that functionality. Remember how you had NFC technology built right in? They actually got rid of that. So what happened? Like Google wasn't on board? Like no, what, what, Google did, what Google did is they bought a company called SimplyTap, and they enabled uh, cloud-based um, payment. They allowed a cloud-based um, NFC payment mechanism using the cloud because they couldn't use the same mechanism as Apple. So we call it HCE, host card emulation NFC. They're basically emulating NFC with the cloud. That's what Google did. They bought another company to do that. So you could have it emulated from the, from the cloud. That's what all Android smartphones use right now. They use what's called HCE NFC, host card emulation uh, NFC. I gave a presentation which was captured in T-Mobile in 2014 or 15. I actually gave okay. a presentation on that. It's on okay. YouTube. So... Um, and Google has gone from, um, you know, don't do evil to, uh, well, we can kind of do some things that are evil, in, in, my, in my opinion. But they do now care about security. Uh, I will say that, but they're painfully slow. And no, I've been I know, I know. But what are we doing now? I know you mentioned all those things about security, but my still thing is safety, Carl. So how does that fit into the mix or is that not even thought of yet is that part of block is that part of your system because like i told you with this vietnamese uv modem which is supposedly the be all end all i'll tell you that i couldn't even get i got speed slower with the new modem than i could with the old modem and the new modem was more picky than the old modem so it required a more cleaner signal so so here's a key point the modem that you're talking about it's either in your case it's on a smartphone right no, this is just a standard modem that uses your home so you could get one gig services. Okay. Which they weren't even able to give me because they couldn't get the signal to come in clear enough. So the best modem in the world is coming from Qual Qualcomm. Every, Qualcomm. Everybody, yes, everybody uses, even, even Huawei uses Qualcomm modems. Um, they've got the best modem in the world. So if you want to insist that you have the best quality coming from the modem, because the modem, it's a feature or function, a technology that goes onto the smartphone. It's on smartphones. It's on your routers. Laptops. It's on, yeah. it's on IoT modules. And Qualcomm makes the best one. So you're paying more money for a Qualcomm modem because it has the best compatibility and the best performance out there. Hands so there down. Has like a, there has to be like a standard that when you're buying, it has to be like a rating. Uh, I used to like Aeris a lot. They were very good. There's no rating. So for the average consumer, other than with our advice is, uh, they don't know what the scale is. They look at something that, you know, uh, manufacturer saying buy this or the, or what do you call it? The cable company says buy this, but they're just looking for the cheapest one. And what I found out is why did they go away from this one? Well, I learned without naming the specific company because there's a lot out there. They actually didn't pay a bill. And the reason they didn't, they didn't pay a bill for a long time, they burned their relationship with one company and they couldn't buy that particular modem anymore. So they went to somebody else who was just dying to give them product. Yeah, so first of all, first of all you don't burn your relationship with Qualcomm, number one. Uh, number two, it's very difficult to form a relationship with Qualcomm. Only the top companies. I, trust me, if you try to approach a Qualcomm person and discuss your technology, they'll say, well, I'm sorry, we're not interested. Qualcomm is a very difficult company to deal with, but they do have the best they do have the best technology. It's a fact. It's a fact. They were the ones, if you remember, that made, you remember Eudora? Nobody uses them anymore, but they actually made Eudora. Then they sold it off. Qualcomm, same company, actually made Eudora, which was a great email program, but the problem is they had a free version, a paid version, and nobody wanted to pay for it. So they couldn't yeah, make it. When you give something away free and then you want to charge for it later, that really doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work with me. So, um, but you know, get so getting back to the the whole future of um, of what we call YPANs, wireless personal area ne networks. Yeah, I, I threw that in there, but I don't, I'm not sure if it sunk in with you. This is a technology that is on smartphones now, but it's not being widely 
used. Are we talking weird. like the fact that I can use my cell phone now, enable my hotspot, and I can basically be able to or network my devices with my wireless? Is that the path we're going down? I think so. It's yeah. called ultra wideband, and yep. some. Yep. Samsung and um, and Apple have this, but it's broader than that. It's broader than that. It's going to go into connected cars. It's going to go into yep. everything. We've seen and it. We've seen it already. Tesla said they're going to roll it out. I mean, I know Ford yeah. is doing some things. Uh, yeah. But my question, I don't know if this is something you touch on or not. Safety. Okay. I don't mean safety for you know blowing something up or having a fire. I read from some of the articles of the panels you were on. Very educational where they talked about, you know, if the kid is four years or younger, they should not hold a cell phone to their ear. But they after should. four years, it's okay? Is that kind of, did I misread that? Or that was no. confusing. I didn't get that. Should be, be <laughs> below the age of 15, you should not be using a cell phone next to your ear because the, 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 the matter, the, the, the brain matter of a, of a, of a so 15. after 15, it's okay because the S, what is it, the SDR, the SAR, absor uh, something SAR. absorption rate, SAR. Um, well, no, no. So SAR is a rate measured for the emission of, of, of EMI coming from the, the device, which emits radiation. Everything emits okay. radiation. Just like, it, just like when they take x-rays, they have a different measuring standard, basically. It's 2.5. It, it normally is 2.5 SAR rating, and smartphones cannot op go over that. Now, every smartphone sold in the United States must go through FCC uh, testing, and, and, and SAR ratings are very, very important. If you don't pass SAR, you can't sell your smartphones in North America. But even having said that, you should not use a smartphone before the age of 15. It's not good. Uh, fortunately, I think we my my we got a, my family we got away with it. I think our daughter was 17 when she started to demand a smartphone for work for school. Wow, uh, demand is the word. <laughs> we weren't allowed to have cell phones in school. That wasn't even permitted. Right. My right. time, my cell phone. You probably remember these days. Uh, my cell phone cost me somewhere around five thousand dollars, and it was a pack that yeah, sat but, on my you know, shoulder. Yeah, so so I met uh, about ten years ago, more than ten years ago. I met the actual founder, the, the actual Motorola engineer, who was the first person to uh, make a phone call. He actually was one of the inventors or the creators. His name was Martin Cooper. I don't know if this name rings a bell, but he's still rocking and rolling. He's in his nineties, and he's still active. His name is Martin Cooper, uh, and wow. he yeah he's still doing things. Uh, he was the first person. I think it was like nineteen seventy four. He made the first smartphone. Uh, the first mobile phone or cellular-like call. It was NEC, and it was Motorola, and I still remember to this day that if you did Function 6, that would enable, if you had the extra kit, it would enable the horn feature, so that if you got out of your car, it would honk the horn. And then right. we got to Nextel days with Push to Talk, and then that Push to Talk went dead. Yeah, that, that's all. I was in that industry also in the 90s. That's what we call land mobile. Okay. So with land mobile radio communications, not digital cellular. So it's a, there's a big difference because that was the analog world. Yes. I was that going was to New York, world. and you know what happened? Uh, always been a security, but we didn't know anything back then, and we'd go through the tunnel, and every couple of weeks we get a call. It's like, uh, Mr. Morris, what's the matter? It's like, uh, your bill is like $9,000. How did my bill go from like 1200 to 9000 Well, you made all these calls, so I look at the thing, and I'm like, well, yeah, roaming calls. I wasn't even there. Like I was there once. She's like, "Oh, you got cloned." Now this didn't happen <laughs> once. This yeah, that happened does. every freaking time I went to New York, and I was so happy when digital cell phones came out because they couldn't clone. They didn't. They used to sit there with like a four dollar device and just grab people and sell the chips. Now I'll tell you, this is interesting. You mentioned this point because I was pretty much the first person to push eSIM to the Chinese smartphone manufacturers back really? in the Yes. Oh wow. Uh, back in the up uh, a French invested company out of Singapore, French guy, and uh, I was pitch pitching the eSIM operating system. And so I was traveling into China trying to convince all the Chinese smartphone vendors to use eSIM because eSIM has a great feature, which is uh, first of all, uh, in America, there's no more concept of globe of roaming because you it's can gone. make a call from any place now. Roaming is kind of going away in Europe. It's kind of gone away in Europe as well. Um, 
and because you can take SIM cards and you can put a new SIM card in for every place. So you, everybody's trying to avoid roaming fees, but the eSIM allows you to completely avoid roaming fees, but also set up really interesting plans. For example, eSIM and something called the Remote SIM Provisioning Pro Program from the GSMA allows you to set up your smartphone, your tablet, and uh, your smartwatch to all use the same phone number number one and when I'm roaming when I'm traveling into another country uh, because of what we call um, remote location registry of the base station and home location mm -hmm. registry uh, in the United States you're allowed to actually uh, set up a separate plan on your smartphone by going up and saying well, okay I want to go to Spain well Telefonica should mm -hmm. be Telefonica movie movie star right right so I can actually program for a week a low-cost plan to have 4G connectivity, now 5G, um, and I set that in my eSIM functionality as the second profile. My main profile is the country that I, I bought the phone and turned on the service, which would be, let's say, T-Mobile in America. Now I want to roam to Spain. Now I can, I have to pull up my credit card and I have to pay for one day, one week, one year nice. uh, service, and I'm effectively getting local coverage, low cost, High yes, when you, when you, just when you travel there, basically. And I'm controlling that. Not right. an operator giving me a bill every month and giving me sticker shock. So the eSIM functionality allows that, but very few com not, not, not enough companies have turned that on. And eSIM was being, um, it was being prohibited um, artificially in the United States. Uh, they were prohibiting this technology. Uh, and I, actually, they, I was... I was interviewed by some Wall Street um, investors who said, why is this going on? And they asked me a bunch of questions. Basically, Apple, Samsung, and Microsoft want this technology on all smartphones to give the consumer the ability to control the plans when they travel into another country. That's nice. Oper operators were, were charging and making lots of money. And think about this. If your car has 4G or 5G and you're in Europe, and your or fleet management, and you're traveling from one city to another, uh, and actually one state to another. You could travel literally in some European countries. You could in in a matter of two or three hours, you can be in three or four countries. You know, if you're making a circle like Germany, France, um, and Italy, those yeah, you could in Belgium or Holland, you can yeah. actually do all those things. So so eSIM it eliminates that need. Because it allows you, the end user, to program where you're going, and you can and you can do it on the fly. You just pull out your credit card, and then what happens is when you roam from one place to another, the base station automatically recognizes the signal. And so, all of these technologies will help you uh, down the road. I was involved in that for two years, from 2016, uh, and even when when I was with ARM, I was involved in eSIM and something called iSIM, which is putting that technology right into the chip. So it's it's now actually going right into the chip. Apple is doing it, Samsung is doing it, Huawei is doing it. The, nice. the future of security is getting better and brighter and it's being taken away from the consumer market who are complaining about not having the security. The security is going, there, it comes right down to the device vendors and the operators. All security for the internet comes back to the mobile network operators. Let's not let them get away scot-free without having better governance. Well, so with, having I, with having IoT, we, we have time just for two more questions and we need to wrap up, but what, when you think about IoT and governance, what I want to know is, with all this happening, who takes the responsibility? And are you and I going to be paying for this as what I call an additional rider to our insurance? Just like I always joke when we have drones in the air, is there going to be drone insurance add-on to our policy? So let me answer that question by telling you that I won't name, name the names, but two operators with consumers who had cryptocurrency on their smartphones was stolen, um, and it was stolen due to SIM swapping. It's a it's a it's a it's a concept of um of social engineering uh, or, or, or 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 spying or let's say what's the term they were. Um, they were spying and trying to get as much information. They went back to the operator. They were able to get the cell phone number, and they knew that this person had lots of crypto on their smartphones. So they were able to use malware by just having the person uh, click on a link, and then bingo, the malware is on your mobile device. So 
they were able to steal lots and lots, millions of dollars of cryptocurrency from users on two networks in North America. I will not na make names. You can go and you can Google it. And so um, basically the operator said, not my fault. The smartphone vendor said, not my fault. The crypto wallet exactly. vendor said, not my fault. Right. Nobody takes responsibility. And that is my only criticism with the cryptocurrency world, which is, the organizations that should take responsibility aren't, don't, don't. and there's no governance because it's a laissez-faire. I'm not criticizing the crypto world, but that, there's your answer. When there's no guy, governance and regulations and guidance, nobody will take responsibility. It's lip service. Well, Carl, this has been really interesting, and the last thing I just want you to sum up for us is where are we going with uh, BOAT and with blockchain as far as the pandemic? Is there anything you could sum up for us in the last couple of minutes? Well, it's very interesting that in China, now people will, will take this, uh, I think, wrong and negatively. They will say, well, well, the Chinese just want to monitor everything. But in China, when you come close to another person that has uh, COVID-19, you will get an alarm on your phone, number one. Number two, when you don't have COVID-19, you will get a QR code and, and a green QR code. The red obviously means danger. Don't come near me. But the green QR code is a safety mechanism that says this person is safe from, from COVID-19. And, and, and actually, I think they're using their, um, uh, I think they're using ultra-wideband in China right now to do that. So they're already using this advanced technology. In America, we're still trying to figure out who has COVID-19 and who doesn't. We can learn from the Chinese. And, and that's what I want to say, that we need to learn certain things from other countries and other cultures. Because the Chinese, um, and Taiwan, for a perfect example, ha also has this technology in place. So we can stop COVID-19. We can monitor it much better than we're doing now. We can use technology to do that. That's the key point that I'm trying to say. Um, I also want to say that your future is the Internet of Things because everything you're going to buy in the future, including your car, will use an IoT module, uh, and that module will be very intelligent and be able to do many more things than you, you imagine. If, can you imagine if you and I had a Tesla right now? We wouldn't even be doing our jobs. We'd be, it would be the thrill of driving the thing and figuring out all the cool things that a Tesla can do, right? So think about all the devices you have in the future when you add the IoT module. Uh, it'll be able to do many, many more things. But the, the key is the security. I, I agree. I know test uh, test driving a Tesla just a few months ago. I have never it's ridden really, it. Really, it's really going somewhere. And I know just even with my washing machine that I got, uh, it's all IoT uh, with technology and things like that and, and different types of things. So I think there's a benefit, but I do think like you do as well, that I'm not a big proponent of the smart house. And the reason I'm not is because the things you hear on TV and what's happened, people rush to get everything interconnected and then they yeah. don't protect their infrastructure. So yeah. I always tell people when you're going to add something to the network, let's think about security first. Um, I have been in the security world since 2008, and so I, I fully agree with that. But I'm actually the guy who's not just sitting around talking about it. I'm actually doing something about it because uh, since 2008, I've worked. I've I've helped to scale and standardize three different technologies on mobile devices uh, since 2008, and I, I feel quite proud of that. So I I don't just you know I I, I this is a side uh, sure. a side issue. I just want to leave you with this. I have been in this industry helping um, enable these cool technologies to be designed into these devices, and then I see news media basically picking up on this stuff you know, months and years later. Uh, and I think to myself, what kind of person do I want to be? Do I want to be a person who just regurgitates the news and really just tells somebody else a story? Or do I want to be a pioneer actually creating the story? That's what I've been in my professional career um, with the East and the West. I've been creating the story because I've been, I have a God-given ability to do public speaking in two languages, number one. And number two, for some reason, I've been the guy who's taken all of this work designed into the smartphone um, su global supply chain and manufacturing ecosystem. My current company is actually, at, um, ITOS is actually based out of Shanghai. Um, and it, it just tells you the technology is evolving. I'm working for a company that's in Shanghai right now, working remote. Um, but again, in my viewpoint, I'm promoting important technology beyond hype. 
I'm, I'm promoting important technology that needs to be out there. I prefer to be a mover and shaker rather than somebody who reports and regurgitates information from other people. I'd rather be the pioneer to help enable the technology. That's what my occur uh, I, I think about. I think you're on the right track when you say that. It's just like kind of like when people go to school, you know, and you ask them they want to learn math, and they say, gee, and my question I always said before I became an engineer, so, so how am I going to use this in the real world? I don't need things that are going to test my brain. I want to know how these things you're going to teach me today are going to change and shape my life. That's, and if you can't tell me that, I don't want to learn it. And that's the reason why when you go to school, you want to go to school and uh, graduate with a, with a degree that's going to help you get a job. Exactly. Well, Carl, this was really uh, educational. Um, I know our viewers have really enjoyed, uh, you know, what you've shared with us about, you know, cellular technology, about blockchain, about boat, and just about, you know, all the things, I guess, that are going to be coming up the pike in the next I don't know, a couple of years to the end of the century. Oh, uh, next, 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 no, next year. <laughs> next year we're going to see some of this stuff already. Well, uh, yeah, because we, um, we have um, just signed our first um, mem mem memorandum of understanding for a proof of concept with a major global um, mobile network operator uh, for our technology. And so I would, I have to be very sensitive about what, about mentioning this. But uh, we have, and so I feel the floodgates, let the floodgates well, open. When, when that opportunity comes and you're allowed to share that with us, we would love to have you back and learn uh, once you are able to talk to that to us about that with more specifics because I think you've definitely perked a few people's ears up today and let them know that uh, IoT is not really just a hype, but it's really going to change practicality in the way people live and do business every day. John, it was great. Uh, it was great to um, have this rapport with you, this dialogue. I appreciate the opportunity to evangelize uh, some of the th the passions in my life and career. So thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much for being a guest. We enjoyed having you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Carl Weaver, a person with who has a wealth of knowledge uh, with the IoT industry and has revolutionized uh, cell phones and the technology in three major era areas. And uh, we'll be following up with him again soon. Again, thank you so much, Carl, for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. You too.